Hello, I am um, Lenora, and um, in a minute, it'll be our Facebook Live time for alternative venues for jazz. And this is an amazing group of community of jazz lovers, musicians, professionals, um, that's been curated and hosted by the amazing Gail Boyd. So I'm just gonna wait another few seconds. Okay, it's five o'clock, I can start. So uh, yeah, it is a little weird. You were right, Jenna, like in, uh, Jason, just kind of like talking to um, the screen. So I hope you can hear me well. If not, I'm gonna try to be on here and watch it um, live too. And I hope that I can figure out like what people are saying. And so I'll be looking here and I'll be looking there and hopefully I can check out what's going on for real. I'll put this volume here down so it won't. Yeah, there we go. So I can see folks. Great. Hey, Gail. All oh, good. I can see people's names. So this time will go fast, I know. And I uh, was talking to Jenna this morning on her wonderful show, 1111, that's at AM and PM. And we were just both sharing how um, it's easy to talk a lot when you're talking about things you're passionate about and when you are in a space of sharing things um like i get a little adhd i don't know i've never really been truly diagnosed in that but my mind i guess that's one of the curses of being a creative that you are constantly thinking of things and constantly um listening to and listening for um the ideas that come to you through all of the different channels if you are finely tuned and highly tuned. Hopefully, that's what we all are. So uh, we have some, uh, some, some things I'm supposed to talk about, and one of them is how um, we're dealing, uh, how I'm dealing with things as they are in this dis disarray, uh, this pandemic. The, the COVID-19 has changed all of our lives, and I think that uh, one of the most profound things that have happened for the music community, for the jazz community, is losing your livelihood, losing the way that you make your income. Uh, I have had so many gigs canceled, my teaching jobs for the summer in summer camps, uh, in Brevard Jazz Institute and Jamie Abersol Vocal Workshop, um, countless gigs. Um, and then there are the, the private lessons, the voice students who, they don't really like or, or know the idea of learning online uh, for my private applied students. So I know a lot of musicians have lost their students, um, those who don't want to adjust. And then those who are really trying to make the adjustment, uh, it's difficult uh, because learning in an online environment is quite different from an environment where you are working in a classroom. It's not just porting your instruction uh, to uh, technology and to an online environment, you really have to re um, create a new diagram in your mind for the way that you pass the information. Um, educating is teaching. It's not, you're not really um, teaching someone so much as you're helping to pull things out when you're, when you're working with a person, a learner. Um, and so that language in your mind has to shift. You have to create um, a new palette from which you work and you have to create a new way to, to um, help that learner transform. Uh, it's always a matter of perception, you know, all teaching. Uh, I love this quote, um, if you capsulize, I read books a lot and I'll share some of those with you. And that's one of the things I'm doing during this, um, this era that we're in now. I'm reading more, I'm going back to the books in my library, in my home, and pulling things out that I have half read. And um, there's a wonderful book, uh, The Art of War for Women. And, and, and it's based off of the Sun Tzu book, um, The Art of War. Um, the Tao of thinking about uh, conflict and resolution. And that whole line of all of warfare is deception. It's like, I changed it and put in the way that I think about teaching and all of teaching, no, it's not deception. <laughs> all of teaching is per perception. And so you have to put yourself in the place of the learner 
And you know, it's, it's a whole different thing. I've had a lot of students, uh, I teach as a professor at the university, at uh, North Carolina Central University in the Jazz Studies program. And I've been there for 15 years. And um, what I've really come to understand about learners in music especially, is that you really have to put yourself in their shoes and really thinking about what it is that they're learning. Not what you're teaching, but what they're learning. And if you make that shift, your online work, this emergency remote teaching that we're all thrust into, uh, for those who are new to that online instruction world, you'll have an easier time. And so, um, just like in every other part of our life, we've had to shift the way we eat. We've had to shift the way um, we live on a day-to-day -day basis. And those kinds of changes and shifts are challenging if we resist. Um, so I find that I have to go to my routines. And my morning routine is I get up and uh, I pray. I, I pray with my husband. Uh, I meditate and I do yoga. I do my HIIT training, H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training, because child please, I can only do about nine or 10 minutes, you know, uh, and then I'm like off to what I want to do on my to-do list. Um, but I've also found um, a lot of fun in like working online and exercising. So one of my best friends teaches a Zumba class online. Shout out to Lana Garland. Um, and I take that class a couple of days a week and I belong to Peloton. So they have, I think for 90 days now, they're going to, they're offering free um, uh, classes on their website. So they have yoga, they have all kinds of cross training. And so engage in, in, in moving your body, engage in working on um, taking an opportunity to connect back to yourself. This period is really about settling in to the things that we, didn't allow ourselves to focus on because we were so busy. We were so busy. And now that everything is slowed down to a halt, you have an opportunity to reset. And so use it, use a positive mindset instead of railing against the way it is. If the longer you rail against the way something is, the more it persists for you in your mind, right? We can't do anything. I love what uh, Dr. Fauci said. Uh, <clears throat> he said the virus makes the deadline. The virus sets the schedule. So all of these people who feel like, um, oh, we're going to run back and get to where, where it was, PSA announcement is it's not going back to that way. So we just really have to find another way to think and be. Uh, and that's what I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of reading, a lot of meditating, a lot of really deep thinking all that ideation time, you know, creatives, we need time to think through our music, we need time to think about what we're doing. And um, this is an opportunity for the music industry, for jazz musicians to move in a different way. I love seeing all, all of the way that people are reaching out and um, trying to uh, play music with each other and trying to give lessons. People are just trying to find a new way to, to, to do what they do. You cannot stop being a musician because there's a crisis. Look and research a way, the way people who've been in war-torn countries, who've had school canceled for years. Um, you know, we have to, to find a, a more holistic way of working. And I think we're being forced to do that. And that's really great. That's why Alternative Venues for Jazz, that title just got me. Gail, you are a genius in that. That title just got me right away. I was like, yeah, I've been thinking alternatively about most of the way I do my work as a musician. So, um, okay, so me as a musician, I grew up in Chicago, born and raised in Chicago. Um, soon as I left high school, Limbloom, hey, Limbloom Eagles, swoop. Uh, soon as I left high school, I went to Limbloom Tech in the south side of Chicago. Um, went to Berklee College of Music and I majored in film scoring. Um, and met an amazing amount, uh, group of musicians there. We were like this, this very tight knit group of, um, you know, just a handful of, of, of black folks um, who were in Berkeley at that time, the class of 1979. So my classmates were, were a lot of people that you know now. And um, so Branford Marsalis and Walter Beasley and, um, uh, Cindy Blackman and Wallace Roney and um, 
Donald Harrison and Smitty Smith and um, Jean Jackson, Jeff Watts, um, who are all my gals? Uh, uh, Rochelle Farrell and um, Mary Wormworth, Dina Anderson, it's just lots of people who are now in the fabric of jazz as administrators at, in, in schools, Ron Savage, uh, Terry Lynn Carrington. So all of these folks now are in the fabric of jazz in all facets. But there was a, uh, a mindset of really working hard and really focusing on the music, being good musicians. And then, so I, after uh, that, I went to New York and I spent 20 years in New York, like from 1987 to 2007. I was in New York City. And I just did what you do when you get there, you, you hustle. I worked five nights a week singing in restaurants, clubs, bars, you know, all the rooms in, in New York that you have to make the transit through. Um, got my first record deal uh, not long after I like I so when I first moved there um, from Boston to New York I worked in a record company in Sony Music in the record division in the uh, business affairs office and then a year before that I worked uh, in the booking agency Norby Walters booking agency and I learned a ton of things about the music industry I learned so much about the business side of it I really like grew fond of that whole marketing, you know, that entrepreneurial part where you have to learn how to book your own gigs. You learn, you know, really what to do to put yourself on the road and how important it is to master that, you know. So I really, like this time during the pandemic, I have been spending more of my time than I, than I had when I'm teaching as a, a professor, you don't get the time you had. So Ooh, this time is, I've been grateful for because I've been able to li walk that talk of spending 50% of my time on my craft and 50% of my time on the business side of it. What's been interesting is uh, my um, most recent recording project is a big band record and trying to uh, market and promote a big band record like that the release date was March 9th, right? in the middle of this whole, like the beginning of this whole pandemic thing. And it's been the angst of like, oh man, you know, I, I hired a radio promoter and they are trying to like get radio to play my record and folks aren't even in the radio stations. They're at home trying to do their best to, to play music. And it's really tough, it's tough. Um, but you keep going, you just keep moving and doing what you need to do. Um, but it's a labor of love. It's 40 men and women, uh, musicians, uh, we're playing. You know, that when I uh, lived up north, I used to hear about the sound of the south, you know, like every region of the country, the jazz musicians kind of have their thing. And it's true, the musicians here in the North Carolina area, they swing hard. And so that's what I really wanted to capture on the record, and I think I... I think I was able to do that with some great musicians and, and men and women and a great uh, engineer who captured the whole record live uh, and did just an amazing job of, you know, of all of that. And so for the next decade of my, my creative life, I really want to, will be working with the Tribe Jazz Orchestra, the band um, on my record. Here it is. It's my uh, seventh release. I hadn't recorded in nine years. And I'm um, really, really grateful. It was a crowdfunded, like 100 folks um, on Kickstarter and Eventbrite helped us do that record. And I got to get some tea because I'm like losing my, well, this is getting craggy. Oh, uh, my chamomile and lemongrass tea. Shout out to Jenna about tea. Um, and my husband was really Fred Hammonds. I really love him. Uh, for being the man who he is and he was a hundred percent behind making sure we got it done um, And so for the love of big band is the record that's out and I'll, I'll put something in the um, In the comments later so you can go and check that out, but I'm on lenorahelm.com I uh, just want to make sure I keep enough time good uh, so we can ask questions um, and so that process of working on that record um, Why did I want to do a big band record right now? Um, I had done every other configuration. I've done trio. My, my previous six records were with a trio or a quartet or a sextet. Um, on this record, I do have lyrics on a song, but I didn't compose anything because I had been spending the, the last nine years working on my doctoral degree. Uh, 
in, in, in music education and I'm finishing up my dissertation. I got a second reader, praise God. Oof. And Catchy Cartwright, she said, the best dis dissertation is a done dissertation. And, and that's right. I can't wait to get this, this baby finished. And so I, I wanted to record. I just had that itch. I said, okay, I'm going to do this recording. I won't have my own original compositions on it, but I'll have some lyrics. All of the arrangements, I, I had people do the arrangements who I love, Cecil Bridgewater, Brian Horton, Lydia Select Dudley, Maurice Meyer. So the project was a big community project, a big community project of love. Um, and, and oof, yeah. So if, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to make sure that I have women who are um, in every section of the band like they are now. Um, because that's another pet peeve. Um, one of the things I did in New York was I was president of International Women in Jazz uh, for about five years. And I learned what women instrumentalists really have to go through uh, in a very visceral way about the bias, biases and just some of the, the things that you have to, the hurdles that you have to get over. Um, thinking that as a woman, you, um, if you're a woman and you show up in a place where music is about to happen, they assume you're a singer. So then there's that whole thing about, you know, what's the stigma about singers, you know, anyway. But um, so in this project, I am kind of on a, a double platform of making sure uh, vocalists can be band leaders and making sure women instrumentalists have a place and a home to be, um, to be heard and to, com you know, be in community. And so um, that's kind of like what I'm working on musically, finishing my dissertation, um, my new baby, the, the big band, Tribe Jazz Orchestra, and living. You know, one of the things you might not know about me when I got married, I'll be coming up on nine years of marriage. Um, my husband had two beautiful sons, and they, between them, have 10 grandchildren. And so I'm a grandmom. Ooh. Um, and so I love that. I love uh, this city gal, you know, what, Chicago, Boston, New York, all city life. Now I'm in the South, and so I, I like gardening, you know. That's another thing I didn't realize I would love. And if my sisters and brothers, my siblings were on this, they'd be talking about who I, how I could never cook, but I love cooking now. So I've become a little domesticated. Mm. Um, but I think... Those are fun things. They give me some some measure of humanity that I was missing because I was so like focused on music, 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 music. Um, but let's see. I can. Oh, there's Patricia. Hey, Andrea Bradfield, Regina. Yay! Hi, Allison. Oh man, it's a lot of y'all here. I love that. Um, so yeah, I think that um, this is a wonderful community. I hope that you will participate in it and invite other members to be part of it because I think the conversation about where jazz music will find its footing after this is over. How do musicians find their work? Who do they, we, 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 we uh, the audiences want to hear the music. That's, you know, we're not confused about that. The artists want the audiences to hear the music. So how do we work together? We're all spokes in the same wheel. It's not a us against them in terms of the presenters or, or, or the club owners or anything. They are there usually like breaking their back and losing money like, you know, in any other business. Um, but this one thing I will share and say uh, to musicians, just please think about working like you're a small business. And one of the things that I've learned because um, a lot of artists that I've been talking to are having a hard time or feel like they can't apply for some of the funding and grants that are out there. They're having to scramble to get their paperwork together. Um, the, the whole paycheck protection program, if you have been hiring and, and paying uh, 10, five, 10 musicians a year and you hire a manager, a publicist, a, an accountant, a creative director, hey, Tambisa, uh, if you've been loving any of the things that are on the marketing that we've been doing for uh, for the love of Big Band, our creative director is Tembisa Mshaka, and she is badass. I love her. But you really have to think about yourself, musicians, as a as a small business, and in doing that, you set yourself up for a lot more opportunities, and you think differently about your income and your expenses. So, are we at the time where questions? Okay, Vash said, leave ten minutes for questions. So. 
How has music marketing changed in the age of streaming? Great question, Gail. Um, so because streaming, actually, you don't make a lot of money. You could have a million streams on Spotify and Pandora and the actual sales, you get like a one cent or two cent on each of your, um, of those downloads or recordings and that's criminal. And that is what it is. Get on an advocacy panel, get on those panels and get in those organizations where you can be the voice at the table to change that. But until that changes, it's important to have your own page where people can buy your merchandise. So if you put together um, a, a Shopify page, I have a Shopify, Shopify page, ZenzaleMusic.com, and they could get your t-shirts and physical CDs, then you have more power over your marketing. Uh, develop your email list because your email list is your, um, that's your permission to, you know, to engage directly with the people who like your music and then you can develop things that they buy. People are collectors, people, fans who, and I hate to call listeners fans, but people who lo love your work will support you, whether they're, some, some people go to, I love that Patreon page. But if you just set up your own store, whether it's on your website, on Shopify page, or whatever platform you use, make sure that you connect directly with your people and so that they can buy the things that you have uh, and they can support your work. Um, maybe you'll find out in, in doing a survey of your email list that they like vinyl. And then you print vinyl and you, and you sell that. But having that information is gold. And because streaming is happening, we have to work differently. Um, let's see. Hey, Debo. Let's see if there's anyone else that it's, it's, yeah, you're right, Andrea. It's about having a good balance. You have to have a balance in your life and in your music. And how you do anything is how you do everything, says T. Harv Ecker. And so whenever I've had an opportunity to play, um, if it were, sometimes I, I didn't have a gig that was for the money that I wanted. Or I didn't have a tour where I knew at the end of it I would, would, um, to, to reap, you know, the, the gross, my net amount would be what I wanted. But then you find other ways to make that work. That's why um, as an artist, you are an educator automatically. You, Billy, Dr. Billy Taylor showed us that, that you're automatically from the bandstand in the position where you can teach about the music. Tell them about each song, tell them where the songs came from. Uh, ask the presenter, can you help develop the audience before you get there? Can you go to a cultural arts center, a church? Some, can you have a conversation before the concert, after the concert? You have to always be thinking like a business person um, and putting yourself in the shoes of everyone um, who is involved in getting the listener to you and you to the listener. Um, let's see if there are other questions there. Hey, Claudia. Uh, Claudia, you know, I've been to Chile a long time ago with, uh, I sang with Emmanuel. Emmanuel? Yo que se donde va, donde vive. Yeah, that's so funny. Can't believe that I think about that sometimes. Hey, Regina, it would be great if musicians could come together and create a platform for streaming where we cut out the middleman. Amen, sister. Yes, we can, right? It just takes like the conversation, like having the conversation and finding out and, and reverse engineering. If we know that at the end of the day, we want to have the money come to us directly, what do we have to have happen? Um, in order for that to, to be a reality. Um, I love that idea, Regina. I'm with you on that. I raise my hand. Artists who have been ad adversely affected by, this is from Patricia. Patricia Murray, she has a wonderful show. Um, uh, so you have to check her out. Let's see. Artists who have been adversely affected by COVID-19 crisis should see if they can get emergency funds. And then she has something that you'll be able to see and catch that link. Yeah, I, I agree, Gail. Let's work on it. So Regina, Gail, hey, I'm raising my hand. Anybody else who's raising their hand on that idea? Let's talk about that more. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. You're going to see Claudia Acuna. I think you're later this week, right, Claudia? Um, just keep watching this page. Gail's been doing a great job of like letting, tag teaming the next person coming on. 
but we should have 10,000 members in this group. Uh, the more people at the table to talk about what we need, the better things will be. I don't want to go over, I have six more minutes. Are you using Bandcamp? What are your experiences with it? I'm not using Bandcamp. Um, my page is on Square Space. Um, I had a young lady, she is a dancer. She's actually Antoine Roney, Rollis Roney's brother, Antoine Roney's daughter, Makara Roney, is a fantastic little web designer and she built my page. Um, and so um, in terms of music, I have my music on SoundCloud, uh, I have a Reverb Nation page, and I really like uh, my Shopify. My, the Shopify portal is where I'm going to really do my merchandising. So, um, yeah, let's see. Hey, Allison, no, nice to hear from you. Is Unity in Power? That's right, Andrea. So, um, one of the things I would love to really see is more um, women on bandstands. You know, uh, when I see a bandstand full of people and it's 10 people or 25 people on stage, I'm going, like, don't you know any women like who play that instrument? I love seeing women in, um, in man management positions, Gail Boyd, uh, Michelle Taylor, um, Karen Kennedy, Laura Gentry. I mean, you know, um, these women have like blazed trails and it's unbelievable um, the kinds of things like the 20 years I spent in New York and the 15 years I've been here, they are still like going strong. And so support each other, you know, in the work that you're doing. Um, this is a cool and unique opportunity for students. Hey, Bailey, to get a look into the inner workings of the business, especially. Yes, Bailey is, is uh, she did a beautiful guitar work this morning. Um, and so uh, the other thing I would really want you to think about is on Facebook, there are lots of people on your pages who are defunct and deactivated. Go pull, pull them off your page and make new friends. <laughs> Bring new people into the fold. This is a great time to reach out and connect and have a big community out there. Um, let's see. The crises that we're dealing with is really real people. So stay uh, away from people um, physically for as long as you can. Uh, don't be pulled into these ideas that we have to hurry up and get out there. This is the time to heal. This is a time to make music, to reach each other in ways that you haven't. Pick up the phone and call people and heal. Heal, your, heal the land. Heal your terrain. Heal the places where you make music. Uh, reach out to young people that you know who, are, who don't know some of this information and spend an hour on the phone with them. Offer to mentor them. Uh, reach out to an elder who they need to feel loved and supported and um, Take care of yourselves. Take care of yourselves. I hope I've answered most of the questions and gotten people to where um, they want to, to do, to be here in this space. Uh, I love, I hope this time stays at five o'clock on um, Tuesdays and that we can support each other in it. Um, please give Gail Boyd support um, because she is, taking a, a risk and jumping out there and saying, hey, what about this? Can we, can we think about these ideas? Can we think about these places where we wanna grow and work? I hope that you will um, come and visit me at lenorahelm.com. Um, yeah, young students out there who are trying to get into the jazz community and to the jazz field, they are really challenged. Uh, they don't have a uh, context for what's happening and they are not as resilient as necessary to persevere through this. So please um, help those young people who are uh, wanting to continue in this business, in the music business, not only in jazz, but period, and give them a hand. Um, so thank you all for joining me. I really, really appreciate you and uh, hope you have had a good time and I hope to see you on this page again. Bye.